Thanks, Jim. No disclosures. So type 2 endo leaks, uh, as I think most of the people know, are basically uh, branches that are still existent within the sac and the flow then becomes retrograde back into the sac, typically either the lumbars or the uh, IMA. And historically, uh, at one month, there's about a 15 to 20 percent endo leak rate. At one year, that diminishes uh, spontaneously to about 8 to 12 percent as the natural course of many of these is resolution. Those uh, that are persistent uh, can uh, go out 6 to 12 months or even longer, and the ones that typically are present around 6 to 12 months tend to stay. A persistent leak, um, like I said, has a slower rate or lower rate of spontaneous resolution at that point. So why not intervene on all of these uh, patients? Why not just say all type 2 endo leaks need an intervention? Well, for one, it requires a secondary procedure. Um, number two, as you saw in the data, many of these spontaneously resolve, and so uh, you'd be treating things that would go away on their own. The endo leaks themselves may be benign. Uh, just because there's an endo leak doesn't mean that there's actually going to be any uh, detrimental cause of that. On top of that, once you kind of go down that pathway, then uh, the question is, uh, are you committed to chasing it all the way? And it, in some circumstances, there may be an inability to resolve these type 2 endo leaks. And on top of that, after treatment, they can recur. Why do anything on the opposite side? Uh, why not just leave them all alone? Well, if you were to go in and measure pressures on all these type 2 endo leaks, what you'd find is some of these actually are systemic, and that, that is that the uh, back bleeding vessels, the lumbar or the IMA, has systemic pressure into that sac. And those are the ones that can actually have a poor or out adverse laid, out laid outcome. And if you look through the literature, uh, you'll find that several reports of um, patients that had a ruptured aneurysm from a uh, type 2 endo leak. So how do we follow these? What do we do? Well, I think CT scan is really the gold standard. You want to get an unenhanced uh, scan, uh, obviously to rule out any calcium or other issues that could be confused for uh, contrast. You want to get imaging in the arterial phase and then the delayed uh, phase as well. And the delayed phase is really critical because a lot of these back bleeding lumbar uh, or IMAs will not be seen uh, in the arterial phase and only be seen in that delayed imaging. So without that, then you're really missing out the uh, uh, potential for visualizing these endo leaks. The advantage of a CT scan is that you get a si uh, sac size. Uh, you can differentiate from other types of leak, that is 1As, 1Bs, type 3s. Uh, the dis disadvantage is that you, uh, you can't identify the direction of the leak, and that can be important as you're uh, tracing these and, and important for recurrence because sometimes it can be flowing from one direction to the other, and that can be important in terms of treatment options. You don't get any pressure uh, uh, readings from a CT scan, so you don't really know if it's a benign leak or not, and obviously uh, radiation and contrast can be an issue over time. I think that duplex ultrasonography is very important. Uh, it's great for shrinking or stable aneurysms. Uh, if you have a leak uh, um, uh, that's a, uh, present on the duplex, then uh, you probably should get a CT scan to further evaluate that to ensure uh, uh, what it is and, and whether it's uh, contributing to uh, any uh, potential adverse outcome. Um, there's really no downside to getting a duplex as long as you are aware that it's potentially not the most uh, sensitive or, or at least specific uh, modality for imaging these uh, endo leaks. This is generally the uh, algorithm that I use and I think probably a lot of people use. Uh, if you have a type 2 endo leak, you want to confirm it's a type 2. I think that's critical and I'll show you a little bit, uh, a couple slides on that. At one month, most I don't think there's many people that would intervene on a type 2 endo leak. Uh, when you're out past six months, then you want to have some information. If you have a shrinking or stable sac, I think most people would leave it alone. If you do have pressure monitoring uh, and there's a low, low or no pressure, then it's reasonable to follow. If you have an increased pressure, systemic pressure, or uh, sac enlargement, then I think it's reasonable to proceed with treatment of the type 2 endo leak. This is what I was alluding to in terms of differentiating the leak and ensuring it's a type 2. <clears throat> I had a patient that was 89 years old, uh, three years out from an EVAR, uh, had a stable sac size for three years, had a type 2 endo leak, and all of a sudden on duplex, the um, the sac size and large we were following with duplex because of the uh, creatinine. And the natural uh, tendency would be to think that this is a type 2 endo leak because it's there and that it's finally pressurizing the sac and the sac is enlarging. But you can see here what the patient really has is component separation. And so again, it's very important to ensure that what, you're, what you have and what the problem is is actually a type 2 and not falsely chase a uh, benign type 2 endo leak. The methods of intervention have varied uh, over the last uh, two decades. 
Initially, everything was done transarterially, then translumbar uh, embolization was developed, and uh, most recently, transcaval embolization. <clears throat> this is transarterial. You come through basically the collaterals, translumbar through the back with a uh, direct sac injection, and then transcaval. And I'll go over each of these a little bit uh, uh, in more detail. In terms of the transarterial, again, it's arterial access. <clears throat> you puncture the femoral artery. You come in through the SMA to uh, to get to the IMA or uh, internal iliacs to the lumbar. Sometimes uh, you can get uh, a lot of internal iliac collateral flow to the, the uh, iliolumbars, and that's a pathway to, uh, to treat those uh, endo leaks. Uh, there can be other branches and collaterals, and typically what you need is a good, uh, healthy microcatheter system to navigate through uh, all the uh, collaterals and uh, tortuosity to get to the endo leak. In terms of translumbar, uh, this came out um, probably about five or so years after, um, maybe about a little bit longer than that, uh, after the, uh, we started really doing the transarterial ones. Um, when it first uh, was developed, there was a fair amount of literature suggesting that it was significantly better than the transarterial in terms of uh, success rates. Uh, as you can see, uh, this paper demonstrated a higher uh, rate of success and lower rate of failure of translumbar versus uh, uh, transarterial. And this one uh, was a uh, concordant study as well looking at uh, translumbar and transarterial in terms of a uh, review and found that there was a somewhat higher risk of uh, success, I'm sorry, somewhat higher uh, rate of success for the uh, translumbar approach and less risk of complications associated with that as compared to uh, transarterial. Typically, again, you take a paraspinous approach. The patients are prone. You come in from the back. You access the uh, sac. You want to uh, embolize the sac as well as the feeding vessel uh, if possible. Uh, complications can occur from this approach. There are uh, reported uh, risk of uh, infecting the sac and infecting the uh, endograft. Um, and then uh, in certain, cir certain circumstances, the uh, coils can be uh, misplaced as well if with confusion. Uh, you think you're in the sac and you're actually not. And there's actually uh, more recently some uh, uh, description of tr uh, modified transarterial approach. And so the original approach with transarterial was to basically embolize the uh, feeding vessel up to the sac. Uh, with the modified technique, it, the uh, recommendation is not only to uh, embolize that vessel, but actually to go into the sac at that point and embolize the sac as well. Uh, and then if by, thereby creating a, a similar effect of the translumbar. And when you use this modified technique, the success rates have been similar between transarterial and translumbar. So I think both uh, at this point, if you, if you take the idea of uh, embolizing the sac and vessel, uh, have pretty uh, equal rates of success. In terms of transcaval, uh, the procedure is done from the common femoral vein typically. You get AP and lateral views. Again, you're going to need some microcatheter selection for embolization of the sac and branches. I think the benefits are the patient is supine, it's simple access, you can get concomitant arterial access to do arteriography, you get direct sac, sac access. Uh, I think there's a lower risk of infection uh, and there's certainly a lower risk of arterial injury as you're not going through all these collaterals. Typically we use a 9 French uh, sheath to access the vein, a 19 gauge liver biopsy needle, uh, the wires are standard wires, we use a 6 French long sheath to access the sac. And then microcatheters and coils and, and uh, embolization material once you get there. This is uh, typically uh, um, uh, some of the uh, tips th to use uh, in terms of the transcaval. You can see there's bowing of the IVC there from the sac and pinching upon the cava, and that's where you're going to go after it and try to uh, access the sac. Uh, once you puncture the sac, obviously you don't want to puncture the endograft at the same time. You want to ensure you're in the sac. And then you can deposit your coils. You can see here the picture on the uh, on the other side was a um, a patient with a large gutter leak, and we use the transcaval approach to uh, access the gutter or embolize that. You can see the good candidate here. The uh, IVC is opposed to the sac. The endo leak is right there. The endo uh, graft limbs are farther away. On the poor candidate, the IVC is farther away from the sac, and then the endo graft limbs are right there next to it. So there'd be a higher risk of puncturing those endo graft uh, limbs uh, when you're trying to get through. Again, it's important to ensure that you're in the right planes. You can see on the AP view, it looks like we're uh, potentially in the sac. And then when you go into the lateral view, you can see we're clearly in the retroperitoneum and not in the sac. <clears throat> there are some publications. Uh, this shows uh, this paper was a review. And you can see that the uh, technical success rates are quite high. But again, there is a uh, uh, incidence of reintervention uh, required for uh, these procedures. And this is our experience. Um, we showed this about a year ago. 
A uh, number of these patients were actually uh, failures from other approaches, and you can see since the transcable approach, the SACs were stable or, um, or shrinking. So in conclusion, type 2 endoleaks may need intervention. There are multiple access op op options. Te technical tips can make a difference, and uh, I think the future uh, is in preventative care, and uh, there are probably some talks on that, but uh, uh, SAC, uh, SAC technologies to prevent from the, the type 2 endoleaks from uh, arising altogether. Thank you.